Greetings, programs. Matthew here from the Awesome Friday Podcast with a very special episode. Jonas Chernick is an actor, writer, and producer who's probably best known for his films My Awkward Sexual Adventure and James vs. His Future Self. This year, he has put on all three of those hats with his latest film, Ashgrove, acting in one of the lead roles, producing, and co-writing with his frequent collaborator, director Jeremy Lalonde. In Ashgrove, he plays the husband of a scientist who might be the only one who can save the world from a deadly pandemic as they take some much-needed downtime at the family farm. Here is the trailer for Ashgrove. We're talking to professor of water chemistry, Dr. Jennifer Ashgrove, one of the many scientists around the world trying to find a solution to the water pandemic. This virus feeds on oxygen molecules in the water that we drink, making water consumption toxic and eventually fatal. Of all the teams around the world, you might be the closest to a breakthrough. Hi, I'm Dr. Lightwin. You feeling okay, Jennifer? I understand you have a bit of a history of having blackouts, is that correct? I know that you're under unimaginable stress. (laughs) Take a little bit of time off, reset your system a bit. It's not possible. I'm just talking about a weekend. We have a farm. That sounds great. Listen, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to let you guys know that I am okay and to get you off of my back. I'm trying. Yeah, she's she's in the hammock. Jason, what's going on? You don't understand. You've been weird lately. I'm a little scared. I heard hushed voices. I am so sorry. What are you doing? Why have you been lying to me? There's a lot going on right now, okay? What is I going can't... on then? You're the scientist they plucked from obscurity to fix everything. Who are you? I don't understand what's going on. I don't remember what happened. You have information locked in your brain that could save the human race. If we don't get it, we're all gone. Jonas and I sat down over Zoom to speak about the film during the Canadian Film Festival. We spoke about how Ashgrove came together and what it was like to shoot a movie about a pandemic during a pandemic. Here is that interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Excellent. Uh, So you're, sorry, Jonas Chernick, and you are the, uh, you're credited as a writer and producer as well on this one? Yep, that's right. And you're doing all the publicity as well, as I understand it. Well, part of my producer uh, duties is that I, I I take on the publicity stuff myself because I find that uh, nobody's more motivated to get the the word out about the movie than 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 me. So uh, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> uh, and you're starring in the film. You play uh, one the the husband of Amanda's character, who is the the last hope of humanity in this pandemic situation. Which, as I understand, it was actually conceived before we were in a pandemic situation. Yeah, we came up with this idea in September of 2019, so about five months, six months before anybody had heard the word. I mean, the word COVID, you started hearing it in December or January, but then it wasn't until March that it became a real thing. Mm -hmm. And we had this idea fully formed before that happened. And in fact, we were nervous in September and October when we were hatching the idea. We thought, are people really going to buy into this idea that there's like a global crisis, that like a realistic global crisis that that doesn't look that different on the outside, you know? But mm-hmm. I, and of course, that did not end up being a problem for us. It sounds like you you have a very specific memory of forming this idea. Where you mentioned a very specific time, what where did it come from? I remember. I've never has an idea come so fully formed in such a short period of time jeremy lalonde my co-writer and director and i we were in a car driving from the calgary film festival to the edmonton film festival promoting our last film james versus his future self 
And we started this conversation about like, well, what do we want to do next? And we were pitching ideas back and forth and we decided, we agreed that we wanted to challenge ourselves and do something different than anything we've ever done before. He and I are mostly known for our comedies. Mm -hmm. Um, We we decided let's not spend years working on a comedy script. We've done that before. Let's do something different. And so we decided, I pitched him on, you know, let's do a character study. Two actors, one location, really intense, really raw, really dramatic and he said well that sounds like it could get boring pretty fast so he's like if we're going to do that we have to make sure the, the the stakes are high so let's let's think let's say the world is ending outside the door and i thought oh that that's pretty cool a microcosmic kind of analysis of a relationship in the midst of some sort of global crisis so then we were just pitching around well what what is that global crisis you know, is it aliens is it zombies is it a virus and we landed on this idea of a water crisis that uh, you know is is slowly uh, but surely picking us all off. Yeah, it all came pretty fast, and it was on that same call, on that same drive, that we came up with this twist that we won't, that you and I won't talk about. That's in the movie that recontextualizes everything for the surprise, and uh, we knew we wanted to uh, to do to shoot it in a way that we hadn't done before. So we came up with this idea of outlining and understanding characters and backstory and character and giving ourselves freedom to play it within the scenes when we're shooting them. Yeah. And I find the whole idea of this process really fascinating. So as I understand it, every scene was outlined and not necessarily vaguely, like maybe quite specifically, um, but then mm-hmm. the performers were sort of free to basically interpret that outline as they wanted. Right. Is that pretty much it yeah i mean that, that's pretty much it and we also left room for there to be surprises so there were, there were the way that we can that we constructed it was that you know all of the actors were were held certain pieces of information were held back from the, from us so that we could discover them and learn learn about them on camera and react to them live so there was an element of of surprise so even though i i co-wrote the script with jeremy and amanda we gave jeremy the authority or permission to withhold information from, you know, any one of the actors at any given time. So there were secrets that were held, you know, each actor had their own secret or secrets and we were playing with the idea, well, what does it feel like if these secrets are revealed or discovered within scenes on camera? So you have a lot of um, moments in the movie where actors as their characters are reacting or responding to secrets or information or deceptions live. And and so we were really interested in exploring what does that do to performance? What does that do to the feeling of immediacy or intimacy? You know, does that bring us closer to these characters? Does it provide a more, you know, dramatically entertaining experience? And, and, you know, we, we found that it did. And people seem to be responding to the emotionality of the movie. And a lot of that has to do with actors responding or reacting to things live. First off, that's fascinating to me. But uh, so, as a, from from a writing point of view, how did you approach it from a like? How did it feel to be performing that as well? Because you are one of the main actors in the film. That's thrilling because, as an actor, you're 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 always trying to create the illusion of spontaneity. You know, you you want it to feel for yourself and for the audience that you are hearing the other actor's words for the first time and reacting and responding to it. And that's where the magic of film lives. But it's fake because you know what the other actor is going to say. When you don't know what's coming at you, when you don't know where a scene is going or what kind of information or conflict is going to be introduced, you are more present than you could possibly imagine. You are you are listening so carefully to what's happening and processing and making... And that's how we are in life. So if... If film is supposed to be a reflection of reality, of if it's supposed to be naturalism, then nothing could be more natural than not knowing what's coming next. And so as an actor, it's very exciting. It's very alive and energetic and also a lot of fun. So I loved not knowing certain things and getting to react and respond to them live on camera. It was a, it was a treat. It, I mean, you definitely, you could definitely tell in the performances there was some some genuine reaction as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that, that's what we were going for. And, it, and it, 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 was, it was conceived of as, as an experiment. We didn't know if it would result in an actual 
movie, but Jeremy was able to structure it so carefully and had had the narrative so firmly for, in the forefront of his mind that he was always thinking about story, story, story. He never let us get too off the, off the page or off direction because he really wanted to tell a compelling, surprising, interesting story. So story was always first before all this other stuff. So in this, um, <clears throat> with all the scenes being improvised and the way that shooting schedules typically work, as I understand them, was there any were there any scenes where something was said, improvised that then had to like <clears throat> that then changed something the already, already already filmed or something you had planned for some some nugget someone had like just came out with and you're like oh shit we gotta we gotta do that we gotta integrate that somehow. I mean, yes, it, it ha that happened so many times that I can't even, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard for me <laughs> to pinpoint anything. I mean, a lot of it was, to be fair, a lot of it was predetermined. So we spent a year backstoring the characters, the relationships. So there was little turns of phrase or inside jokes or, you know, pet names or things like that, that we had already had established so when we dropped into a scene we would we knew how we would interact uh, or or the nuance of you know relationships the 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 history of a relationship how it informs the way a, a fight plays out or an argument or a conversation or a love scene but all along the way there were there were nuggets of little things that that happened that came in surprised us i mean there's one like there's one moment where i, I my character is walking my wife through the garden and I'm explaining what I've done with the garden and mm -hmm. that scene and it ended with me I say something about yeah I've really she's like you've done a great job I said yeah I don't know I've, I've kind of developed myself a, little, a, a green thumb and then I, I say I should really and then we both say at the same time get that looked at as in get that green <laughs> thumb that was not planned that was not we'd never said that to each other before that was just one of those like serendipitous moments and it plays as a couple who know each other so well that they they have the same sense of humor, they have, they have the same instincts, comedic instincts. It just it just like one of these little things that happened that was totally natural, totally real, spontaneous, but that ex communicated exactly what we were trying to communicate about that couple in a way that we couldn't have done it if we'd scripted it. It just wouldn't have felt the same. It wouldn't have felt the same to the audience. Right. That's amazing, actually. At what point did you decide I'm going to be in the movie? Like from oh. you're writing, you're producing it, or was it from the start? You're like, this is a movie no. I'm going to be in, or from the beginning. That's always I'm an actor first and foremost. I write scripts and I produce movies merely as a means to an end. Like I do those things so that I can be an actor. So, I, <laughs> okay. so I'm I'm writing scripts so that I can write great roles for me to play when I'm not acting in other people's TV shows or movies. And then when I have time, I'm like okay, now I'm going to produce this thing and get it going. All of that is with the end goal of being an actor. So it's always, I always know that this is something that I'm going to act in. I would never develop a project that didn't have like a really fun, juicy part for me. I, I, I just, I love, I love acting is like my the joy. It's my, that's my happy place. Nice. You know, writing and producing, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> You've already worked with, I think, um, Sean Doyle before, right? Or at least you worked with him twice in this one festival. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, did you was this? Did you conceive this with Sean and Amanda in mind? Amanda was immediate, so it was that same car ride where Jeremy and I hatched the idea for the movie right away. The conversation within ten minutes was, you know, who we want to reach out to play this lead, and we both said Amanda Bruegel. She's worked with before she was in his second feature film called sex after kids she mm -hmm. won an actra award for it um, i've known amanda for years I, we hadn't actually been in a scene together we'd been in the same projects but never acting together but i knew her and it just that just made sense sean was somebody that i've worked before with on a, a number of different projects and who i've always considered to be like a mentor he was one of the first great actors that i had the privilege of working with when I first started working in TV and film and I just watched what he did and asked him a ton of questions all the time and he was so generous 
I know I've I we've kept in touch over the years, and I've always been looking for the right role for him in my films. And this one was seemed perfect, and he was you know so brave to say yes, and he said yes immediately because he he was interested in the process of of pu- pushing the boundaries of how we make films and trying something new. As you know, I I just finished speaking with him. I asked him how he came to be in the film. He's like, well, Jeremy called me, Jeremy and Jonas called me, and I love sex after kids, so I just said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so seems like a match made in heaven, as it were. Yeah, and he was so great. Uh, and you know, you, you never know um, if an actor can do it. What, what I'm talking, well, what I'm describing as this sort of process, not all actors are improvisers and not all actors are writers but essentially all of these actors had to write their own characters they created their characters from the ground up and then they had to basically write their dialogue on the fly and we got really lucky because everybody was great at it especially sean I mean, he was just natural he has such a compelling such a compelling guy you just want to watch him when he's on screen you can't take your eyes off him so so it was it was great shifting gears just a, a little bit you know, this is a Canadian film festival. You're in two films in the Canadian film festival. As I understand it, you primarily work in Canada. Is that, have you made like a conscious choice to stay here, to work in Canada? Or is it, do you, do you, I mean, you must go where the work is, I'm sure. But is your, is your, well, luckily, the work has been in Canada. And I lived in LA on and off for about six years and kind of da- dipped my toe in, in that. But I kept finding that I kept, Coming, but you know, I'd go down there for pilot season, or I'd go down there and you know screen test for something. But then something would call me back in Canada, and I'd come back here and work. And you know, I quickly realized that I mean, I'm I make a living as an actor and a writer and a producer in this country, and I'm able to tell my own stories. And I don't have you know, I don't have anyone telling me how to do it. And I have a lot of freedom, creative freedom. And I don't think I'd be able to do that in the United States. Uh, it's it's just a different vibe. Uh, there, it's it's a, it's a different beast. So I, I decided after a few years of you know straddling both the border, I just decided this is where I want to be. I also got you know got married and wanted to have kids. And thought, well, where do I want to raise my family? Uh, Canada is where I want to raise my family. <laughs> uh, and so I I yeah, I've been very happy to be here. So yeah, it was a conscious decision. And I don't know, it's it's never too late. I'm I uh, I'm happy to go back there and dip my toe in again. But right now I, I'm very happy. I'm very fulfilled here. And I love making films and, and making TV and, and occasionally doing theater and all that here in Canada. It's funny. My, my best friend is from England and we were talking the other day and he, he straight up asked me like, what makes, what, what makes a Canadian film? Not just in terms of like it was filmed here, but like, is there a, do you feel there's like a specific like tone or type of story that we tend to tell that sets us apart in a more meaningful way from America in particular? I mean, that's a question I get asked a lot. And I feel like a story is a story. You can't help but tell tell your story from your perspective. So if your perspective is that you grew up in Orange County, you're going to tell a story differently than if you grew up in Winnipeg like me. And it's hard to put your fing- my finger on what that difference is, but it's kind of what makes international cinema so exciting and so interesting. I think it's why we like watching movies from Norway and South Africa, you know, and, and there's something about seeing the universality of s- the story from other countries. I know, like, my most successful movie that I ever r- wrote and produced and acted in, was a comedy from 10 years ago called My Awkward Sexual Adventure, which is about like a nerdy guy whose who's fiance dumps him because he's lousy in bed. So he goes on an adventure, series of adventures to become a better lover. And I made the film and we made it in, and we shot it in Winnipeg and it's set in Winnipeg and Toronto. And it did really well. It played at TIFF and, you know, it sold around the world. But what I wasn't expecting about that was something about that story resonated and i sold it to set like seven different countries bought the remake rights to make that movie and this is all over the world from india to lithuania to poland to france they all there were producers in each country that said oh i want to tell that story and set it here 
And so we sold this, the Korea, we sold these rights to all these different countries and all, and three of them have been made, which is amazing. Uh, and they're all the same story told from the perspective of, of that country. That was fascinating for me because I didn't realize I was writing something that was so universal. I thought I was writing something very Canadian. The movie is, feels very Canadian. And yet something about that story hit a nerve with other countries, with people in other countries. And so I think that's kind of the magic of it. It's hard to put your finger on, but it's, it's a huge piece of what we do. It feels like part of what you're saying is we have a very specific experience and we also have a very universal experience and they are kind of the same. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's an interesting overlap, paradox. Well, just to, to bring it back to Ashgrove for a moment. So, and I don't want to talk in too much detail because I feel like there's a kind of a big twist at the end, or at least a reveal. I think a better word for it is reveal that recontextualizes mm -hmm. the whole movie. And given that it's improvised, or a lot of the dialogue is improvised anyway, how, how did you approach either as a writer or as a performer or both? There's definitely scenes that, I mean, it must have had to go through them twice, right? You know, that's, that's one of the great trade secrets of my director, Jeremy Lalonde, was that he and I kept that secret for a really long time from some key players in this film. And, and you're right, he, we needed to have multiple versions of the same scene. Is that what you're talking about? That were because they played out in different timelines or different ways. And yeah, he. It's so hard to talk about without giving. It's okay. It. I mean, let's, I think it's, it's safe to say we, we needed to have certain scenes play out twice, at least yeah. twice, in very different ways. And Jeremy was able to do that without letting on what the secret was by simply telling the actors, giving the actors a, a, a broad direction. Okay, we're going to try it again. We're going to do it totally differently just to see what happens. Why don't we try it where you're like this and you're like that, you're more angry and you're less angry and let's give it a go. So the actors, we thought we, you know, we thought we were experimenting and trying new ways of approaching the scene when in, in actuality, Jeremy had a very specific agenda and had an elaborate system of keeping track of what we had, what we needed, where it was going to place, which timeline for use, lack of a better word, it was very elaborately. I mean, I, sometimes he'd have to take 10 minutes and go and sit by himself, binder, and like rethink things and make sure. And he had an, uh, his story, we had a story editor on the film, Spencer Giese, who's an amazing uh, writer in his own right. He was like our sort of the keeper of secrets, and he was Jeremy's sort of um, right hand man. And he, he would, he would, ha he had access to all of the, the truth. Um, and he also kept track of which actors knew what and who, which lies and secrets were being held from who. It was a pretty elaborate mind game, all of it. Yeah, it sounds very intense, but in a really <laughs> thrilling and thrilling and interesting way. Yeah. One question I sort of like to ask generally is, and you can approach this however you like, actor, writer, whatever. Obviously, the film has this really unique and interesting production story, and I think it's got a fairly like relatable relationship story in the middle of it. But what is something that people aren't asking you about, but that you wish that they would? Oh, that's a great that's a great question, Matthew. And I, <laughs> it's such a great question that I don't have an answer on the tongue, <laughs> you know, because people ask about the the reveal which is a big piece of the movie. People ask about the process. People ask about shooting the movie during COVID, which is nuts. Like, I, I feel like everything that I love about the movie or that I, that I got, that I get passionate about has been, is, is all stuff that I've been asked about and that, you know, interviewers or journalists like yourself have shine, shone a light on. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. I, I'm really uh, like, I wish I had a, a, like something juicy to tell you. You know, I think pro probably, look, I think when you watch the movie, the movie's intense. It's got a lot of heart, a lot of humor, but it's intense. And for us making the film, there was an intensity that had to do with the circumstances. We shot this in se September, 2020. We hadn't left our homes, most of us in six months. It was the first time we were with other people besides our families. It was the first time we were bubbled with a group, sometimes without masks, because we were so 
we were in such a remote location that we were safe. It was the first time that we interacted with other people in half a year. So there was an intense, it was an intense time. There was like strong relationships built between all of us. And I think a lot of that intensity translates into the drama and the, the sort of thrilling nature of this movie. And, you know, that's something that it's like a footnote, really, I don't think a lot of people would, would know, or would think about, but, but it's there. It was a big piece of the experience. Excellent. That's an excellent answer. I don't know what you're worried about. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Well, anyway, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I want to thank you for your time. I very much appreciate it. When the, the film is currently playing at the Canadian Film Festival and it played, I believe, at Glasgow Film Festival, and where is okay. it going? Where's it going next? Uh, we premiere this week. Our U.S. premiere is uh, CineQuest Film Festival, California. They're doing a virtual version, so it's it's uh, it's up on their platform. We have a bunch more festivals coming up that I can't say because I haven't been announced yet. But we'll be we'll be running through the festival circuit through the spring into the summer, and then in the fall we will have a Canadian theatrical release. Yes, movies still play in the movie theaters. It's very um, exciting, actually. Very exciting. And then after that, we'll be on uh, on pay TV in Canada, and we're in the process of closing some deals for international distribution. So, you will the movie will become available in the UK, in the US, and we'll see how many other countries. When we say pay TV, is it like on demand, or is it going to one of the Canadian streamers? Uh, both. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So you're not allowed to tell me which one it's going to yet. I can't. I can't. The deal's not done yet, so <laughs> I have to. <laughs> Very little as a producer, but that's one thing that I've learned. You can't talk about a thing until it's confirmed yeah. because it will fall apart. It's yeah. just the nature of the world. So Yeah, you yeah. don't want to jinx it. I don't want to jinx it, yeah. But I'll let you know, and then you can post it on your site. Cool, man. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and uh, all the best with the rest of the festivals, and I hope it does really well. You bet. Thanks so much, Matt. Take care. Ashgrove is making the rounds on the festival circuit now, so look for it throughout the year before its theatrical release this fall. I'd like to once again thank Jonas for his time. It was a pleasure speaking with him. This episode of the podcast was recorded and produced by me, Matthew Simpson, on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. If you've liked what you've heard, please consider giving us a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice. Or if you would like to support us a little more directly, we also have a Patreon. A link to that, as well as all of our other content and where to find us on social media, is in the show notes. I want to thank you all for listening on this awesome Friday.